So welcome everyone. Um, greetings from the Australian National University here in Canberra. Uh, my name is Jay and I look after international relations and partnerships here at the ANU. Um, and I'm joined today by my colleague Arthur Shu and of course our speaker for today, Dr. Chatura Bandutunga. Uh, let me begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people who are the traditional owners of the land where ANU is located and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Now, let me very quickly introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Chatura Bandutumba. Um, Chatura is a research fellow and part of the Center for Gravitational Astrophysics, Department of Quantum Science at the ANU Research School of Physics, uh, where his research has focused on development of interferometric metrology techniques for high res resolution optical sensors. Chatura is also part of the Applied Metrology Laboratory here at the ANU, uh, and where his work spans projects in fiber optic sensing, optical spectroscopy, coherent beam combination, and laser frequency metrology. His current work focuses on the integration of digital modulation techniques to augment optical systems and enable the synthesis of novel interferometric sensing architectures. Now, some of you may know about the Breakthrough Starshot initiative. Uh, Chatra was a lead author in a recent study where his research group here at the ANU discovered exactly how many lasers and in what formation would be needed to propel the probe far enough and fast enough. Um, I think they're trying to reach uh, Alpha Centauri and hopefully do so in about 20 years or so, um, definitely within our lifetime, uh, that would be great. Um, now, for his groundbreaking research, Chatura has also won many awards and prizes, including the Carver Prize and the Harold Wesley Allen Memorial Prize. Um, outside of physics, Chatura is a passionate musician. I understand he has a degree in music uh, as well, and he enjoys photography. Uh, look, without any further delay, I'll now hand over to Chatra to tell us how we may develop high precision and low cost optical gyroscopes uh, for an autonomous future that's not very far. Um, over to you, Chatra. Well, thank you for that uh, warm welcome and, uh, and introduction, Jay. Uh, and thank you all for uh, joining uh, on this Zoom webinar for today's discussion. Uh, the way towards an autonomous future requires a lot of work. Um, this work is in all sorts of different areas, whether it be building different types of sensors, uh, developing the software that drives all of it, or informing the policy and legislation framework that's needed to integrate these new technologies uh, in a safe and meaningful way to our society. But really, when we think about autonomous vehicles, what we think of is all the cool technology, the cameras, the radar, LIDAR, and machine learning and artificial intelligence that goes along with it. Today, however, I'm gonna be talking about something that takes a back seat in our vehicle. It's less famous contributor, inertial navigation, and specifically one of its critical components, the gyroscope, the optical gyroscope to be specific. And optical gyroscopes are something that I work on uh, with my team here at the Applied Metrology Laboratories uh, at the Australian National University. Through this talk, uh, I hope to be able to go through a couple of things. First of all, introduce what inertial navigation is, uh, and then move on to how fiber optic gyroscopes uh, work and how they contribute to this inertial navigation system. And we'll close out by talking about what we do here at the ANU to make uh, gyroscopes and fiber optic gyroscopes in particular uh, better for the future. So before we get to inertial navigation, we have to get to inertial measurement. And inertial measurement is absolutely everywhere today. It's in our smartwatches, measuring how we move and tracking our fitness. It's on our automatic production lines and keeping our robots moving in a safe and efficient way. It's used to track the motion of our vehicles, be it on the water, under it, on land, in the air, or even on other planets. Now there's a common thread here, and that is in each case, we're looking at motion. We're in the business of measuring movement. But you might look at this collage of images that, that's on the screen at the moment and think, okay, this looks like a solved problem. It's everywhere already. What's so hard about autonomous vehicles? 
And if you look a bit closer, you might be able to see that there's two kind of distinct categories where things fall into. There's these expensive ships, spacecraft, uh, and, and mining vehicles, or there's the smartwatch or consumer drone. You have these expensive vehicles that are used by governments and industry, and you have our uh, small consumer electronics. Autonomous vehicles, however, fall somewhere in the middle. They need the performance and the safety that it brings uh, comparable to an aircraft, but you don't really want to pay too much more for your favorite Toyota RAV4. So you're trying to get the performance of these high performance sensors without compromising on the cost of the system. So to get into some of the details of inertial measurement, uh, we can break down uh, the components that go into one of these measurement systems. And these components have to be able to determine the acceleration and rotation or rotation rate to be specific of a body uh, or an object without any external input. So just by measuring internal motion. Now there's three types of sensors. Uh, that we need to do this. Two of the main ones and then one auxiliary. The first one that I'll talk about is the well, first one is the gyroscope. And these measure your angular velocity uh, or rotation rate. Now, th this amounts to your roll, your pitch, or your yaw. The second type is your accelerometer. And these measure your acceleration in a linear uh, direction your X, Y, and Z. The last set of uh, sensors that are usually included in an inertial measurement unit, uh, or IMU, is magnetometer. And what this allows you to do is measure the Earth's magnetic field. It effectively gives you a reference for which way is down. And that becomes important uh, a bit later on when we start talking about perspective. So together, we can combine all of these uh, sensors to form an inertial measurement or inertial navigation system. And an inertial navigation system synthesizes the results or the output from these sensors into one, uh, one value or two values to be specific, one for your position and one for the direction you're facing or you're heading. Now you might be thinking, Okay, inertial navigation sounds cool, but we have other, other things that do a similar thing. We have GPS, we have LIDAR, we have the stars that can help us navigate by night. What's so different and what's so good about inertial navigation? Well, if we it essentially boils down to having a different way to find your way. Satellite navigation works by telling your absolute position relative to some satellites in known orbit. And that can give you a really precise location uh, on, on the Earth. Inertial navigation is fundamentally different in that it measures the changes in your position and direction. If you stay still, an inertial navigation system cannot tell you where you are. But there are some unique advantages to inertial navigation. Firstly, it's based on internal measurements. You don't need anything from the outside to tell you if you've moved. And so it can work in places where you don't have access to this information. This might happen if you're underground, might happen if you're underwater, or you simply don't want to be detected. The second case, and this is the important one for autonomous vehicles, is that it, inertial navigation systems can measure changes in your position and direction a lot faster than GPS. And so if you're moving in a vehicle, whether it be on the ground or in the air, your inertial navigation is able to track all the little motions to make sure that you end up in the right spot. And in between, and that's in between what the GPS can tell you. So typically what we do is we take 
all of this information. We don't just discard satellites. We take our satellite information. We take information from radar and LIDAR and we combine it with inertial information to get the best of both worlds. And that's where you hear terms like sensor fusion crop up, where you're trying to synthesize the best navigation measurement you can from all of this information. So let's jump back a bit to that perspective problem. So when it comes to inertial measurement, we really need to know where we're looking. And that's because if you imagine traveling in a straight line and then flipping upside down, an inertial navigation system needs to know and remember which way was up. Otherwise, it'll tell you you're going in the wrong way. This mapping is known as mapping from the measurement frame or the frame of the inertial navigation system to the global frame, the frame of the world. Now, there's two ways that inertial navigation systems do this. The first way, and it's not so much in use anymore, is to use a stable platform. And this is where you measure rotation and you stabilize all of your other sensors, your accelerometers and magnetometers to a stable platform on your, on your system. As this platform doesn't move, it always knows which way is up and your accelerometer measurements are in the right direction. The second type is a strapped down inertial navigation system. And those are the ones that we'll talk about coming up next. Strapped down systems track the rotation using their gyroscopes and use that to continuously update what the navigation system knows its accelerometers are doing. So if the gyroscope says, okay, we've fa we're facing upside down now, then the accelerometers will switch uh, direction and still be able to tell you the correct uh, navigation uh, output. Now, to get a sense of how hard a problem this is and, and where some of the pitfalls might arise, I'll ask you maybe, a, maybe something that you've tried before, uh, maybe, a, maybe when you're a bit younger, which is try to walk in a straight line However, keeping your eyes closed. Now, how far do you think you can get? Can you get five steps? Can you get 500 steps? Or maybe you can travel a kilometer in, an, in a perfect straight line. If anyone's tried this, you realize that very quickly, you're gonna start drifting way off course and likely you'll hit something that you didn't think you'd hit. And that's because even using our internal human sense of mo in motion, we tend to drift, we tend to drift off course and inertial systems suffer the same problem. So for a strap down inertial system, we, we have a diagram which looks quite complicated for how we actually get our inertial measurement. So to start off with, we have our two sensors, our gyroscope over here and our accelerometer over here. That's all the information we start out with. We don't have anything else. Now the gyroscope, we have to correct for the Earth's rotation, and then we have to integrate it in order to go from rotation rate to rotation angle. And once we have rotation angle, we can know which way we're facing. Now the accelerometer can't do anything until the gyroscope has told it which way it's facing. And so any drifts are a big problem because this is a very coupled system. Everything depends on everything else. This is compounded because these drifts add up. You're integrating. You're integrating your rotation rate to get angle. You're integrating your acceleration to get velocity, and then again to get position. And so any kind of drift that you have in your initial sensor measurements, they're going to add up and compound. And so we'll take a little pause here to think of um, where, where are the biggest problems that arise in this kind of system? Which sensor do you think will cause the most drift and over what time scale? And so we have our two sensors, accelerometers and gyroscopes. And 
over which time scale do you think they're going to be the biggest problem? Is it going to be over short time scale like minutes or long time scales like hours? I'll give you 30 seconds to have a quick think about it. All right, so we, we see that we've got a strong vote for accelerometers over the minute time scale and gyroscopes over the hour time scale. And that is in fact uh, the correct answer. We can go to the next slide, there we go. So if we look at um, this plot on the, on the left, what we have is the different errors from different different types of sensors. So you have your uh, accelerometers and then you have your horizontal facing, your X and Y gyroscopes and your Z gyroscope. And you can see at short time scales, it's that blue trace, uh, that purple trace, sorry, that's dominant. That's the accelerometer. Now at longer times, uh, the, this orange curve starts to accumulate and accumulate. And those, those alongside the yellow curve, those are your gyroscopes. And so over the course of two hours, four hours or a day, your gyroscopes start to dominate uh, the drift of your inertial navigation system. And if we go back to our diagram before, we can kind of see why. And that's because the gyroscope has to do this initial, initial calibration. It needs to tell the accelerometer where, where it's pointing. And so even when, it's, uh, e even when you're not moving too much, this correction starts to uh, mess up where the accelerometers uh, are pointing. And so the key takeaway here is that over long timescales, gyroscopes are the limit uh, of inertial navigation. So we're talking a lot about gyroscopes what types of gyroscopes are there? There's three main types that I like to think of. The first one is an inertial gyroscope, which uses the inertia of a spinning mass to measure rotation. The second type uses a vibration, vibration structure. It uses the resonant modes of whether it's a, a microelectrical me membrane or the larger hemispherical resonators. They both measure uh, vibrational modes of mechanical objects and changes in those vibrational modes to determine their rotation. The ones I'm going to be talking about, however, are optical and they use uh, an effect called the Sagnac effect. Now, taking the, if we imagine uh, taking one of these gyroscopes uh, and putting it on a inertial sensor, have a guess at how long the best optical gyroscopes can ma maintain good navigation performance. So another quick question, is it over hours, days, weeks, months, or years? All right, let's see. Hours, hours is, hours is common for most optical gyroscopes. The better ones, the ones used for inertial navigation can usually go about a day, but the really high performance ones used for ships, uh, especially submarines that need to go long periods of time without GPS, they can do weeks at best. So that's really good, but they're also incredibly expensive. So how do we bring that performance to uh, uh, down in cost?
So optical gyroscopes, because of their cost and because of their performance, they're usually used in these applications such as uh, unmanned uh, underwater exploration, uh, space exploration, or in aircraft. But really, we need that performance for uh, autonomous navigation as well. Now, there were two types on the slide before. There was the ring laser, which is uh, an example of one is up top, but more common today is the fiber optic gyroscope. And that's what I'll be talking about in more detail ahead. But both of these, both of these different um, architectures, both of these different types of uh, optical gyroscope, they work on the same principle. That principle is the Sagnac effect. Now, what happens with the Sagnac effect is if you imagine a closed path, so a circle, and you imagine light traveling clockwise and counterclockwise. If you rotate that circle as the light's traveling, the light traveling in the direction of rotation needs to travel that little bit further. The light traveling in the other direction, it doesn't need to, it has an easier time. That results in a small, um, small difference in the optical phase between the two beams. The time difference means that there's a phase difference. And that phase difference is proportional to the rotation rate. So you can see here, uh, there's an there's a optical system on, on the right. And if we have a closed path, such as this loop of fiber, we have a clockwise and counterclockwise beam, the phase that we measure at our photo detector will be different if it's rotating and it's proportional to the rotation rate. Now, the way we do this measurement, the way we measure optical phase is with a technique called interferometry. And this is an incredibly powerful technique. Uh, it, it's the cornerstone of uh, big science experiments such as the LIGO project, You've, uh, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. You can see an image of LIGO Hanford, the arms of this interferometer are not in a closed loop, but they're in two different directions. Um, but the operating principles and the sensitivity that you're able to get um, or aiming to get is, is the same. The same ideas apply. And so what we do at the ANU is try and take some of these ideas from gravitational wave detection and apply it uh, to our gyroscopes. So the get into how interferometry works, let's have a quick recap. Um, so if we have an electric field or a light field, we can uh, write it out as a complex exponential where A is our amplitude and phi here is our phase. And we can represent this, at least in the real axis, as a sine wave and that's, uh, that's oscillating and then we detect this sine wave and we measure the power. And the power is related to the square of this field. Uh, the modulus square, I should say, the absolute square. And for a single electric field, we'll just get a constant power. Now, when we add a second electric field, we get interference. And interference is best uh, explained, well, explained by taking the sum of the two fields, or the, and this principle is called the superposition of fields, and then we can uh, determine what the ampli uh, the power and uh, phase is of the combined field. So in the case of having two electric fields, E1 and E2, uh, and in the case that they're equal, all we need to do is sum them up and we get 2E1. Our amplitude, however, is, our amplitude's doubled, because they're the same uh, amplitude. However, our power is uh, multiplied by a factor of four because everything is squared. Now you can see in this instance, we have constructive interference. Our two electric fields are in phase. They line up precisely. Now, the opposite uh, can happen as well. We can be perfectly out of phase. And this is the principle you uh, behind noise cancelling, except this is an optical equivalent. So in this case, the two electric fields cancel out to zero. 
And so our power that we measure is zero. Now these are two extreme cases. What we're really after is a more generalized term, uh, a generalized form. In this case, we go back to our complex exponential representation and we have our first electric field with a phase of phi, our second electric field with a phase of phi, but with a small difference. We then compute the sum of these electric fields for the total electric field and then take the square. And what we get is a power or intensity proportional to the first field, the second field, and this cosine term. And this cosine term is our interference term and this phase difference, that's our phase difference that we're after. And so our phase difference uh, in, in the case of the of a gyroscope is proportional to the Sagnac phase or the Sagnac effect. Now this phase difference is determined by the area of the Sagnac loop. So the bigger the area, the bigger your phase shift. It's also dependent on the rotation rate and that's what allows us to tell the rotation rate. The last main thing it's dependent on is the wavelength of the light. So if this changes, um, then your phase that you measure will also change. Should also note that this phase difference is for one, one loop. So as pictured here, just one loop. If you have lots of loops or imagine a coil of fiber, you can multiply it by the number of loops you have. So let's throw out another question. So let's estimate how much fiber is required to build a gyroscope to measure the Earth's rotation. Now this is uh, gonna be a ballpark question, so have, a, have your best guess, but assume that the, our gyroscope has a radius of five centimeters, about this big. And then the optical wavelength is a telecom wavelength of 1550 nanometers. And it's optical uh, sensitivity to uh, to phase of one milliradian. So have a guess as to how much fiber is required to build a gyroscope that can measure the rotation rate of the Earth. Fifty-two kilometers of fiber. Oh, we got uh, quite a quite a spread here, but nobody likes half a kilometer. Uh, well, the correct answer we can work out. So, if we uh, we know that the Earth rotates one revolution or two pi every day, we can calculate how many seconds that is. Uh, so on the screen, it's 24 hours times 60 minutes per hour times 60 seconds per minute. And so from that, we can figure out what our rotation rate is in radians. So that's 7.3 times 10 to the minus five. It's a small number. So if we convert that using our equation up here, uh, keeping our number of loops as an independent variable, we can get the phase difference per loop or per n. It's three times 10 to the minus eight. Like that's a, that's a small number. How many loops are required if we have a one milliradian optical sensitivity? Well, we need 33,000 loops. Now we know our radius of our gyroscope is five centimeters. And so what we end up needing is 10.5 kilometers of fiber. And it might seem like a uh, kind of abstract thought experiment, but this is the kind of scale of length that you need for fiber optic gyroscopes. Anywhere between one to 10 kilometers is uh, quite often the case uh, for these types of devices. And the longer the, the longer the fiber, the more sensitivity you get. And that's because this number of loops increases. So 
you can you can make a better sensor by improving how how sensitive your sensor is to rotation and so that that you can do by increasing the length increasing the number n you can also do that by making the loop bigger you can increase the area um, but there's only so far you can go with this. You can't have an infinitely big gyroscope. You can't have an infinitely long fiber. And so the other option, the other lever we have to pull is we can, uh, we can try and reduce the noise of our system. So we can take that one milliradian phase sensitivity and, and try and make it a little bit better. And to do that, we have to identify what are the problems with our sensor? What's causing these, uh, these limits? We have to find out what they are and then try and reduce them to impact that uh, reduce their impact on our sensor readout. What this boils down to is basically increase our signal, increase our length, increase our area and reduce our noise, improve our signal to noise. Now for a, for a gyroscope, a uh, fiber optic gyroscope, there's uh, the easiest way to do this to improve our signal is to have a bigger coil. But that's not always possible. Sometimes we want these gyroscopes to fit into small places. So the only option we have is to address these noises. We have to address these technical noise sources. And the three I'm gonna talk about today are Rayleigh scattering, optical polarization drift, and temperature drift. Now the key thing about all of these noise sources is that they compromise your long-term stability. And if we remember from the start, that's what's going to mess up our inertial navigation system. That's what's gonna limit us in the long run. And so to kick things off, Rayleigh scattering. Now Rayleigh scattering you might be familiar with because it's the reason why the sky is blue. It's scattering that occurs uh, when the scatterer size is smaller, smaller than the optical wavelength. So the scatterers are one to a hundred nanometers. Now this is, uh, this improves as you go to uh, longer wavelengths. So as, as you go into the infrared, your Rayleigh scattering reduces and that's, and that's great. Um, however, it's still, still the main cause of loss in telecommunications grade fiber optics. And so if you're using that type of optical fiber, which is the, uh, the lowest loss fiber that you can get today, you're still going to be limited by Rayleigh scattering. In a fiber optic gyroscope, what happens is that this Rayleigh scattering means that light that was originally going clockwise ends up going backwards. It goes counterclockwise. And then because of that, it picks up additional noise and then causes our phase to deviate from its true value. It's true value determined by the Sagnac effect. Now, um, the majority of this comes, uh, majority of the scattering comes from the middle of the coil. And that's a problem because if it reaches the middle, and gets all the way back, it's traveled the same distance as light that's gone the whole way around. You can't distinguish it. Now, the way that people get around it is that they use a really low quality light source. They use an LED. And what this does is it means that the, the stability of the light source is not very good. It has a lot of phase noise. And this phase noise means that this the errors from the scattering are averaged out. It's smeared out. It's too noisy to tell. And for a lot of applications and a lot of gyroscopes, this works well enough. But if you're trying to do, if you're trying to beat the best, you need to get past this problem. The second thing that, that's a major limitation is optical polarization. Now, polarization, you might be familiar with polarized sunglasses. Uh, which keep your eyes protected um, during the day. But polarization effectively um, refers to the orientation of the electric field component of uh, a light wave with respect to some frame of reference or a polarization basis. 
So the easiest one to, to consider is, is linear polarization. We have one polarization state. And it, in this case, it's vertical. Now, you can have more complex polarizations uh, where you have a combination of uh, two different polarizations. And there might be time delays between the two resulting in a phase shift. And that's the case with circular polarization. Or they might be of different amplitudes, which gives you something like elliptical polarization. The key thing here, though, is that different polarizations don't interfere. Orthogonal polarizations don't interfere. And if you don't have an interference uh, term, if you don't have any interference, you can't measure phase. It's not good for interferometry. So the way gyroscopes or fiber optic gyroscopes deal with this is that they use uh, fiber polarization control. And there's different ways to do this, but it essentially boils down to stressing the fiber so that the glass is really stressed in one particular direction. And this rotates the polarization to align with that direction and stay in that direction. It's called polarization maintaining fiber. Now the problem with this is that it's very expensive. Normal fiber you can get for a couple of cents per meter. This stuff will cost dollars, if not more. And when you start to have kilometers of this, that cost adds up. Now, this is uh, one way to uh, reduce these errors, but the, it's, it, it's only part of the solution. Uh, in order to really clamp down on polarization effects, you need additional optics like fiber polarizers to clean up the polarization state and remove the polarizations that you don't want. These are additional optics that cause additional losses and cause additional problems as well. So dealing with polarization is a big challenge. The last big challenge that I'm going to talk about is temperature drift. Now changes in temperature, you can imagine if you have a, a coil of glass or optical fiber and the temperature increases, it's going to expand. And that expansion causes the length to change it causes your phase shift as a function of rotation to change. And so um, when you have a temperature change, you have thermal expansion, you also have your refractive index changing. And, and this, causes, uh, this causes your optical path length to change uh, and then your calibration goes wrong. It also changes your light source wavelength. Your light source needs to be kept in a nice stable environment. Uh, otherwise, the wavelength will drift. And if you remember, the phase shift also depends on that wavelength. And so any changes here will cause um, that phase shift to change, not because of rotation rate, and that's bad. So to get around some of these problems, um, what they do is they, is they have a special coil winding technique called quadrupole winding. And this balances out some of the thermal effects so that the clockwise and counterclockwise sides see the same thermal environment at the same time. This, this works to a certain extent, but has a limit to how well it can, it can uh, be effective. A key problem is the light source. It's really hard to be able to measure the wavelength of these really uh, poor LED light sources that they have to use. Remember, they have to still address Rayleigh scattering. And so uh, you're in this uh, situation where you have a really poor light source and you are really susceptible to the change in wavelength. And that's the big challenge uh, that these fiber optic gyroscopes are trying to address. And so what we do here at the ANU uh, me and my group and the group broadly at the Center for Gravitational Astrophysics, um, we use a technique called digital interferometry. And this is a technique that's been developed in the ANU for the past decade or so. The key idea behind this technique is that we use pseudo random modulation. You can imagine, at, imagine it as a binary code, ones and zeros, but in a pseudo random way. And we use these codes to track different optical paths. 
And the way they work is they act as a unique identifier. It's almost like a label or a barcode that you add to each optical beam. Now, when we detect, we can look for these barcodes and find our signal, find our signal beam, find our signal interference, even when there's a lot of scattering interference going on. And so it allows us to extract our signal from the noise a lot cleaner than what's otherwise possible. Now, the way this works, so we have a pseudo random code. Here's one I prepared earlier. It's got seven symbols. There's uh, four ones and three zeros. And um, it doesn't look particularly pseudo random because it's so short. But what we do is we encode our light, uh, we encode our signal beam with it, and it flips the optical phase. So you can see that the phase starts out and then it reaches a transition here and it flips, it flips back again, stays steady and flips. And this really scrambles up our signal. It really, it scrambles it up, but in a way that we know. And so when we put this beam that's now scrambled into our optical system, it travels, it travels around the coil a couple of kilometers and comes back to our detector. And it takes some time to do that. It picks up a delay. And that code, that barcode picks up a delay as well. Now, what we can do is after we receive this code, we can decode and we decode uh, digitally. So we, we use signal processing to take a local copy of our code and try and line it up with what we receive. And when it lines up, we get our interference pattern back. We get our interference. And for every other delay, it's still a scrambled mess and averages out to near zero. Now using this, we're able to isolate different signals. We can use, the, we can use this ranging uh, property to find different signals in our system. But importantly for gyroscopes, it allows us to reject other signals. Other signals that might be from scattering, that might be from polarization, or might be due to changes in the coil length. Uh, and it'll also allow us to track changes in the coil length and the laser. So what we're doing at the ANU is trying to address those key noise issues, those key noise problems that uh, plague fiber optic gyroscopes today. Our research team is using uh, digital interferometry to try and track these changes or suppress the problems from uh, parasitic interference. And by doing that, we're aiming to improve the long-term stability of these gyroscopes while also reducing the cost. And that's what's needed to be competitive for autonomous vehicles. And so the, the, the work is done at the Applied Metrology Laboratories. The team is down there at the bottom. We're part of the Center for Gravitational Astrophysics. Now the Applied Metrology Laboratories do a lot of different stuff. We have uh, our, core, uh, our, our core ethos is to develop high performance optical sensors for industry and government and do that by translating research from gravitational wave detection instrumentation. So we have projects, we've talked about inertial navigation today, but we have projects in uh, remote optical sensing, vibration, microphones, trace gas detection, uh, laser combining and optical phased arrays, the measurement of time and frequency, and in developing 3D volumetric imaging systems as well. And as always, we're looking for new and motivated. Uh, creative is a unique uh, trait that we really like uh, people to join our team. Uh, the team is, is quite large. We have eight academics and uh, currently eight PhD students as well spread across three laboratories. And with that, I'll like to open up to questions and thank you all for listening. Well, thank you, Chatara. Uh, so please put your questions through. We've got We've got a few minutes to get through some of them. Um, now is the time. It's a very fascinating talk, Chatra. Thank you.
I still don't see any questions coming through. This generally means everyone's understood every word of what you said, Chatra. <laughs> oh, well, there's a the question. So I think they're just starting to come okay. through. Now. All right. So what are, what are the uses of a gyroscope? So uh, th there's a couple of uses, the, and it really depends on the sensitivity that you're able to get. You can use it to measure rotation rate. That's what it uh, measures, but that can be used for navigation. It can be used to track motion of a robotic arm. It can be used to stabilize a drone. Uh, there's, there's lots of different applications for it. Uh, it really depends on how sensitive your device is. So we have a question here about a PRBS system or pseudo random bit sequence uh, in your system will increase the cost. Um, this uh, is, it depends on where the cost in the system comes from. And at the moment, the cost of uh, high performance optical gyroscopes is actually in the coil and in the coil by a significant amount. And that's due to that polarization maintaining fiber. The next big cost is also in the light source. So if we're able to use uh, cheaper, um, cheaper fiber, cheaper optical fiber and cheaper light sources, both of which we can uh, do with our technique, um, it, it'll give us a leg up on um, the, the cost problem. So there's a, uh, there is some cost increase, but there's a lot of cost gain. Thanks for the question. Here's a question, uh, is a gyroscope better than LiDAR? And my answer to this is uh, there's, no, there's no better technique. Uh, they're, they're both equivalent. Um, I, I wouldn't say equivalent, sorry. They're both complementary is the word. So LiDAR gives you information about your surroundings. Uh, gyroscopes give information about your motion. And so they're two different sets of information and together they can be, uh, they, they tell you a lot more than they do on their own. Uh, can an optical gyroscope be used for satellite positioning without human intervention? And um, an optical gyroscope on its own um, cannot. You'll need to be part of an inertial measurement system. But often for something like satellite positioning, you want some other types of reference. You might be using uh, stars uh, in the sky, uh, or you could be using other satellites to provide that reference. Um, Uh, question here is how to reduce latency in gyroscopes. So gyroscopes measure significantly faster than um, what well, gyroscopes and accelerometers, inertial measurement systems in general, can measure significantly faster than um, something like a GPS. And so the the latency um, uh, you're probably seeing in if you're building a system, for example, might actually be in the communication between your sensor um, or your sensor output and the the system that you're trying to control with it so that uh, getting the measurements is one thing getting them into and processed uh, to give you navigation is another part of the problem uh, my guess would be that's the part that you need to address there uh, would you please explain why you need both accelerometer and gyroscope so uh, they provide two different parts of the puzzle. So gyroscopes only measure rotation, uh, rotation rate, I should say. Uh, and so it can tell you your orientation, but it can't tell you your linear motion, your X, Y, and Z. 
And so the accelerometers come in to tell you that information and they, they only tell you that information. It's the combination of the two together that allow you to uh, produce an inertial navigation readout. So the question here is in uh, optical fiber gyros, what wavelength is used? Is there a possibility of using other parts of the EM spectrum in a similar way to get better results? So the key thing here is loss. You're using a lot of optical fiber. And so you want to be able to minimize the amount of loss you're getting. That means you can increase the length and still get a signal. If, you're, if you lose all your light, you don't have anything to work with. And so for that reason, you find fiber optic gyros often work in the telecommunications windows. So you see a lot at uh, 1.5 micron, you'll see some at 1.3 micron. Um, and so th these are common telecommunication windows and that's where you'll generally find uh, fiber optic gyroscopes working. There is no fundamental limit uh, otherwise, provided you can keep the loss of the fiber optics down. This is an interesting question. Do gyros or are gyroscopes affected by the gravity difference at the poles and equator? And it wouldn't be as much the gravity difference as the magnetic field difference. Now there's an effect called the, um, th there's a property called the Verdant constant and that causes changes in the optical polarization as a result of the magnetic field uh, near the fiber. And so that can, that can cause, uh, that can cause, uh, effects uh, that result in polarization change uh, and then um, sorry Faraday effects is what is, is what I'm after Faraday effects magnetically induced polarization change and that causes noise uh, that in your gyroscope so it's not the gravity difference but it is the magnetic field difference that can cause a problem uh, how crucial uh, is the line width of the light source. And that's, an, that's a really interesting question. Now, for Rayleigh scattering, the typical method is to, uh, is to use a lot, of, uh, a lot of phase noise to broaden out the, sorry, to, to broaden out the effect due to Rayleigh scattering. Uh, another way of putting it is to reduce the optical coherence length so that there is minimal coherent Rayleigh scattering. Now, in that case, the line width that you're after is uh, something akin to a superluminescent diode on the order of about 50 nanometers. Now, th this, can be, uh, this can be changed um, because the, the trade-off here is the stability. The stability of the light source is of that uh, spectral width or line width is hard to maintain. Uh, so uh, it's, it's always a trade-off in that respect. Uh, the question here is how could the gyroscope counteract situations where is where there is bias instability? Bias instability is the you can think of it as the drift of the gyroscope. And I'm going to take this question as how does our gyroscope do this? Um, using digital interferometry, we're able to track our bias drift uh, and use that to correct for our, our system. Uh, so we can, we can try and minimize the effects of, of bias instability that way. Um, and uh, I think I see a follow-up question to that. How does bias instability affect the performance of the gyroscope? It, it typically limits the long-term stability of these systems. So that, there's another question with regards to uh, accumulating biases. Uh, the goal here is to try and minimize these biases. So uh, that's some of the work that's ongoing here at, uh, at ANU is to try and find ways using digital interferometry to 
minimize these biases so that their accumulated value is, uh, is less. Uh, we have a question here about uh, the use of digital interferometry in other areas. Uh, so the nice thing about digital interferometry is it allows you to track multiple signals. And so in the gyroscope, we're only interested in the clockwise and the counterclockwise beam. It's kind of a simple system in that respect. Uh, but you can imagine like a laser array, for example, has lots of signals, one from each, uh, each laser. And so we can use uh, digital interferometry to track each laser independently and, and correct for them like that. So that's, uh, that's one example. Uh, what are the types of gyroscopes used in mobile phones? So typically in mobile phones, what you'll find is a, is a MEMS type uh, gyroscope. These are little chip based ones that use, um, based on vibrating structures. So you're looking at the resonance frequency of that vibrating structure. They are very low cost, uh, low power as well. So they have distinct advantages for applications such as mobile phones. So how does the gyroscope based on the Sanyak effect tell uh, orientation of a plane or any moving object? So to start off with, you can only determine the change, uh, the change in orientation. So you have an initial orientation that you start with, and then the gyroscope will track how that changes. Um, and if you have one of them, you can track it in one axis. If you have three of them, you can track it in full 3D space. Can vibrations of the system be a significant contributing factor towards the error in measurement? And the short answer is yes. However, uh, an inertial measurement unit has accelerometers. It measures these vibrations. And so we can actually um, use some error correction coming from other parts of an inertial measurement system to uh, make sure that our gyroscopes are working optimally. Uh, it is still uh, something to consider when designing a fully uh, deployable, field deployable system, for example. Um, what determines the pulse rate uh, needed in your pseudo random uh, pulse modulation? So to clarify, this is still a continuous uh, wave technique. There, it, it's not a pulse technique. The pseudo random modulation is on the optical phase. Now, um, what determines the pulse rate, we need to be able to resolve the clockwise and counterclockwise beams. And this means that the, uh, the sorry, the, the symbol rate is what I'll, I'll prefer to call it. The symbol rate needs to be faster than the transit time of the coil. So if you imagine light going from one side to the other, it, there needs to be more than one pseudo random signal uh, in that coil. And that's the main restriction there. And that allows us to identify our clockwise and counterclockwise beams. And I'll answer, let's say two more questions. Uh, but if you have further questions, feel free to, uh, feel free to pass them on uh, to the team here. Um, what are the typical laser powers used in a kilometer scale gyroscope. Um, there's a couple of uh, concerns with using high laser power as well. Uh, and this comes down to effects like stimulated Brillouin scattering, which causes light to um, create um, acoustic vibrations uh, in, in the fiber and then reflect back. There's also um, nonlinearities from effects like the Kerr effect that change the refractive index and thereby change the optical phase. So you can't have the laser power too high. Typically, you look at it on the order of several milliwatts is, is what, you're, what you're working with. So um, not, not that high in terms of optical power. It's certainly not enough to, um, say, burn through uh, clothes or anything like that. Uh, 
And uh, we'll, for our last question, uh, how compact can the optical gyro be, uh, especially when compared with MEMS devices? And this is a really interesting question. And, and it's where the trade-off between MEMS and, gyro, and optical gyroscopes kind of overlap. So what MEMS struggles with is the performance. What fiber optic gyroscopes and optical gyroscopes in general struggle with is the size. And that's because we're dependent on the area. So if we have zero area, we have zero signal. We need some area to work with. And so you can typically get uh, fiber optic gyroscopes with a couple of centimeters uh, diameter, and you'll need three of them along your three axes. And that kind of limits what your size can be. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Shatra, for taking all those questions. Um, and to everyone that tuned in today, thank you for coming along and thank you for asking those questions. Um, we do have many more uh, talks coming through uh, later this month and um, sometime in July as well. Uh, if you're interested in physics or astrophysics or those kind of areas, um, there are still a few talks around optoelectronics, nanomaterials that will take place next week. Um, it is a long weekend here in Australia, uh, or most of Australia anyway. Um, so we won't have a talk on Monday, but on Tuesday we'll be back um, with Dr. Will Grant, who will speak about, Will is from the Center for Public Awareness of Science. It's a unique center at the end, and he'll talk about misinformation during COVID. Um, so thank you once again for coming through. Um, if you have any questions, you can see Chatra's email over there. Um, Thank you, Chatra, for providing that. You can also see email of the lab director, that's Professor Zhong Chow. Um, so please get in touch with them if you're interested in reading more about their research, having a look at their papers. You can find them, you can find them on the ANU website. Um, or if you're interested in studying at the ANU and doing a PhD um, with the group over there or with a member of the group um, or undertaking more than master's degrees. So thank you again for coming along. Have a great rest of the day. Um, enjoy your weekend. Um, and we'll see you next week. And thank you once again, Chatura.